Hi everyone and welcome back to another video. If some of you have been around here for a while, you might remember that I used to make a lot more kind of atheisty type content than I do now. I mean, I still do occasionally. I mean, this video is kind of half of that. I still cover, you know, Girl Defined and certain books and stuff. Um, but it, it did used to be a lot more common than it is right now. But still, back in the day, I did a lot of reading and fact checking terrible creationist books and I, I covered books by people like Ken Ham and Kent Hovind and things like that and one of my favourite like or, or some of my favourite comments that I used to get were from um, just very stubborn creationists who were so adamant that they were right and they'd always be you know saying things like oh well if you think life came from rocks then you must have the intelligence of a rock or the people who would say stuff like <laughs> you know the typical if we came from monkeys why are there still monkeys or a personal favourite of mine was like, oh, if life came from the sea and evolved, show me a fish with legs. And today I'm here to show you a fish with legs. <laughs> kind of, not really. It's not a fish with legs, but I do want to talk about a fish who spends the majority of their life, other than about 25 days, on land. They are literally a terrestrial fish. They are a creationist's nightmare and an evolution Noah's interest. That could have been catchier. So like I say, today I wanna to talk about a fish which isn't just classified as an amphibious fish, but they are full on described as terrestrial fish after many more years of research and observation and people looking into them. They are absolutely fascinating and beautiful and that is why today I want to talk to you a little bit about Pacific Leaping Blennies, which is a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> Blennies in general, or if you want to get technical, Blenniformids are a family of fish who are generally very small and very, very cute. They have these long, thin bodies, these long fins down their back, and they kind of look almost eel-like at times, but then they have these like really big eyes and this really big mouth, which just makes them super adorable. Back when um, I was still doing the podcast with Stephen Thomas, one of the episodes that I kind of, I guess, hosted or, or ran was about the science of cute and why we think things are cute and, and what is the purpose of being cute. And it was always said that like one of the big characteristics that made something so cute and made us want to protect it and look after it were really, really big eyes. And that's what little blennies have. And that's why I think I just find them so adorable. They're so cute and I love them. Anyway, back to grown-up voice because surprisingly I am an adult. Most species of blennies you will find do live in the water, more specifically in the sea. Um, even if it's just kind of like scuttling around the shadows, they'll spend all of their life in the water. And that's pretty normal for a fish, right? But one particular species of blenny is the Pacific Leaping Blenny, or for the technical name, Alticus anoldorum. Really hope I'm saying that right. Or if we're being super casual, sometimes you'll heard them referred to as leaping rock skippers, and there's a good reason for all of these names, and we will get to that very shortly. These guys live in coastal regions around the south and west of the Pacific Ocean, but they're especially prominent on Guam. In Guam? On Guam? Around Guam. Leaping blennies are small boys who, and I use small boy as a gender neutral term because anyone can be a small boy. Even Kyra's a small boy. <laughs> Why am I like this today? They're little small boys who generally only grow to be around four to eight centimeters long. So they're really, really tiny. And interestingly, despite being fish, like I say, they spend their entire adult life outside of water, living in the splash and intertidal zones on coasts. So these little guys spend most of their time hanging out on rocks, but occasionally they need a little water to splash over them in order to breathe because they are fish after all. They need to keep their skin, and especially their gills, moisturized. That said, despite needing a little splash of water occasionally, and let's be honest, we all do, there's no evidence that leaping blennies ever like to be fully submerged in water or actually spend any time submerged merged or swimming about. Because of this, Dr. Terry Ord, who is one of the leading experts in leaping blennies, which I think is a wonderful thing to be an expert in, he says that they offer a unique opportunity to, to discover in a living animal how the transition from water to land has taken place. Uh, you can find some details on his published articles on blennies down, uh, like, referenced, referenced in the video description for this video, the, the description for this video, you know what I'm trying to say. They will be uh, all referenced fully down there along with all the other sources I'm using to research and create this 
video. I don't know why words are so hard for me today. I, actually, I do. I've got a little bit of a cold, I'll be honest. I'm feeling a little bit, a little bit fuzzy headed, a little bit coughy, and a little bit rough. So please bear with me. I was really worried it was COVID for a while, but I've taken tests and I'm good. It's just normal, regular cold, apparently. But it just means my head's a little fo foggy and fuzzy and I just... Words, I'm sorry. <laughs> so Leaping Blennies are often described as offering a unique window on the past as they, and I quote, provide an evolutionary snapshot of each stage of the land invasion by fish, according to good old Dr. Ord. Leaping Blennies do share a lot of the same traits with their other Blenny relatives. For example, they still need their skill, skin and gills to be kept moist in order to stay alive, as we mentioned earlier, otherwise they will asphyxiate and die, which is why they live in the intertidal zone, so they can get splashed with water when they need it. They are, as I say, fish after all, even if they live out of the water. However, Unlike other blennies and more like amphibians, leaping blennies, their skin can absorb oxygen straight from the air, which is how they can survive on land for most of their lives. They've also evolved plenty of other features which make them particularly suited to life on land. For example, their skin colouring makes them perfectly camouflaged on rocks, which keeps them safe from the predators that normally wouldn't be able to get to them in the sea, like birds and lizards, but also other ones who are kind of like in and out of the water like crabs. Their teeth are perfect for scraping algae off rocks and they have a preference for kind of fresh algae that's just been exposed by outgoing tides. And so they spend most of their day kind of shuffling around, eating this, just living a pretty chilled out life, you know? I can respect that. I first read about Leaping Blennies in the uh, Blue Planet 2 book because if you guys don't know, I, I love my nature books. I have a very large collection of them. I love books with beautiful photographs and um, animal facts and, you know, just information about nature and plants and life on earth and you know what I'm trying to say. And anyway, um, so I first heard about them in there and there's a beautiful description of their days in that book. At high tide, the waves were often so violent that the Blennies spent most of their time clinging to rocks or sheltering in crevices and holes above the waterline. At low tide or at high temperatures, the Blennies were observed to retreat into moist crevices and rock holes to avoid drying out. So you can see they just do spend their life flittering around on rocks and scuttling around and just kind of having a good time. You know, eating some algae, hiding from predators, doing their thing, maybe mating a little bit, just being blennies. They never actually like go for a swim. They never submerge themselves in the water. They just, they just are. So to summarize all this, one news article wrote that they're so fascinating from an evolutionary perspective because, and I quote, they are behaviorally terrestrial while continuing to be constrained by their dependence on water for respiration, which I just thought I'd read you because I think it's a pretty damn good summary. And I know I've been a little bit flittery in this video. Another similarity between leaping blennies and other water dwelling blennies is that both have quite motile tails. Where the difference lies though is in what gives the leaping blenny its name. So generally most blennies have these tails that can move from side to side and it helps them swim. You know, like a kind of regular fish, they have this sort of motion and it helps with the swimming, it helps them get through the water, it helps streamline them, you know, as you do. Leaping blennies on the other hand, their fin is naturally kind of like this, but they can twist it 90 degrees so it lies flat against the ground and they can use this to basically propel themselves off the rocks, leap off the rocks, almost like an oar or a lever or something like that. Combine this, this uh, kind of tail leaping pushing action with a little bit of force from their tiny front fins and it means that if they want to move around from one rock to another or they want to get out of a hole or they're trying to avoid um, a large wave or a predator or something like that, a blenny simply twists its tail so it's flat to the rock and then uses it, like I say, like an oar to propel themselves, leaps off the rock into the air onto another rock and, and that's how they get their names and it's pretty damn fun to watch. I will try and add a video in here as long as it doesn't get copyright claimed but otherwise I recommend you go um, search up on YouTube's videos of leaping blennies because it is so good to watch. I love it. But as well as this, the tail um, being so long and being able to have it flat to the rocks um, it kind of provides a little more surface area to help them cling onto the rocks so they don't get washed away by waves if they do get hit by one and it also provides a little bit of extra balance for when they're just climbing and clambering around. So many uses. One final interesting way that blennies are different from other fish is uh, how they mate, actually. So male blennies tend to form little homes in holes and crevices on rocks on the coast. And once he's found his little hole, 
he'll pop out and he'll start bobbing his head up and down for a while and he has like a little fin that comes up to make his head bigger so he's more attractive to the ladies and this head bopping it really gets the females going they're like oh I want that one so the female will come along scuttle into his little hole and she'll lay her eggs and then she'll potter off and probably eat some more algae or something like that. The male Blenny then goes back into his hole and he sees all these eggs and he fertilizes them and then it's his job to protect them. And the eggs, like I say, they're fertilized, they grow a little bit. And then after a little while, the tide comes in and washes them out to sea. And this is the only time in their lives when Blennies, or leaping Blennies rather, are actually fully submerged in the water, fully at sea. So after around 25 to 30 days, they're not sure the exact amount of time, they're still observing this stuff, they're still learning, but they think it's around a month. Uh, little baby blennies who have hatched in the ocean will come swimming back to shore and they'll come scuttling up to the rocks and they'll join their families and their friends and the other little leaping blennies. You know, they come marching back out of the water and they live the rest of their lives on land. They continue to grow to be full adults on land and they never fully go back in the water and I just think that's pretty cool. I really do think they're fascinating little creatures who really are a sort of like transitional species if you want to call them that. And I don't understand how anyone can look at them and observe them and look at their relatives and not believe in evolution, not understand evolution, not see this very obvious evidence of evolution. We've got mammals who live in the ocean, we've got fish who live on land. <sighs> It's so easy to see how all animals are connected in, in different ways and I don't understand how anyone can really look at the natural world and not understand that evolution is this very real and very incredible thing. So next time a creationist wants to scoff about fish with legs, feel free to just send them a video about leaping blennies, or even better, just send them a video of leaping blennies leaping, which is without explanation. Let them do their own research. I think that would be fun. <laughs> but until then, I hope you found this short little video interesting. I, I don't want all my videos to be too big and heavy or long and too hard to digest, so I just like doing these fun, silly, light ones sometimes, if that's okay. I love weird animal facts. I love talking about animals and plants and fungi who are just a little bit different or unusual or special in some way and that's why I want to talk about these little guys today. Uh, please let me know what you thought down in the comments below and hopefully I will see you guys again very soon. Uh, my next video is a big deep dive into the untitled film stills of Cindy Sherman and we're going to be doing a little bit of photography analysis and kind of art history and discussing about that kind of stuff. So again it's a very research heavy one, it's quite big and long but I think it's gonna be good. I'm feeling very good about it so far. It's just taking a lot of time. Um, so yeah, please stick around for that. But for now, thank you for watching and I'll see you again next time.